everybody jay radha madhava kunja bihari radha madhava kunja bihari jay radha madhava Gopi Janabalaba Giri Badan Gopi Janabalaba Giri Badan So, the man, the 
Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Sri Sri Gornitai ki jai, Sri Sri Jagannath Baladev Subhadra ki jai, Sri Vrindavan Dham ki jai, Sri La Prabhupada ki jai, Sri Harinama Sankirtanam ki jai, Sri Hat Padanga ki jai, Go to Goloka campaign ki jai. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, um, it's not some, let's say, uh, what do you call it? Something to do with, you know, our goal to go to Goloka, it certainly is. But it's a specific campaign which is inaugurated um, by Vaisheshika Prabhu and others in the uh, senior Vaishnavas who are very enthusiastic to see Srila Prabhupada's books distributed by one and all. This is not a monopoly. The distribution of Srila Prabhupada's books is everyone's opportunity. It is the greatest opportunity. Practically, we may not be able to do other activities like deity worship, farming, opening restaurants, even opening temples. We may not even be able to go to a temple. Um, there, All these activities are so wonderful right, in serving Krishna, but Everyone can distribute books, practically speaking, some way or another. It's a, it's a great privilege, a great opportunity. So this Go to Goloka is this campaign now from October, November, December to distribute as many of Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as we can all over the world. The target, I think, is three million between every, no, everyone, all over the world. Combined effort to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books in this particular time with the Christmas book marathon, Prabhupada book marathon coming up shortly, and the um, Gita Jayanti, I think is early this year, early in December sometime. A great opportunity to be a part of this, I say, special, special concession. Go back, back to Goloka, go to Goloka. Taking everyone back, back to Goloka Vrindavan. And this is the mess, but this is Prabhupada's given us this mess as uh, achieving this objective goal by giving this knowledge of the past. The goal also explains Goloka Vrindavan, Ishrima Bhagavatam, and giving us the path to 
back to God into. So please do join us if you are all able to be an instrument, an instrument as Arjuna was an instrument on the battle of Kurukshetra, an instrument for Krishna's will to become an instrument for Prabhupada's will and uh, take this little opportunity to uh, distribute books to a friend, to a family member, to a neighbor, to somebody you don't know on the street, a program online, somehow or another share this transcendental knowledge with others. And the best way is to give them Prabhupada's association and the association of all the great acharyas contained in these literatures, the great personalities who appear in these literatures, past, present, and future, etc. Anyway, we're going to have transcendental book distribution, KJ. Go, Premanandi. All glorious to the, all the assembled devotees. All glorious to Sri Guru and Greg. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sadasate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvasesha Sanyavari Vastachare Shatarine Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Hare Krishna So we are now in Zurich in Switzerland and we're here for a few days and then we go to Italy for a few days and then back to South France for a few days before we return back to New Mayapur to prepare for the Prabhupada Book Marathon. So um, we haven't been to Italy actually as, as since we joined the Hare Krishna movement. I've never been to Italy. So this is the first time in about, I think the last time I was in Italy was in 1963. It was. I, I remember because I looked it up yesterday. I was mentioning it when I was last there. There was an earthquake where we were. So I looked it up to see what year it was. It was 1963. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I tell a lie. I did go back again, hitchhiked through the north of Italy in 1969. So that was the last time we were in Italy. So 53 years and visiting devotees in one part of Italy a few days. Um, but wherever we are, uh, you know, we have our technology to bring us, you could say, a little closer together um, in different parts of the world to try to put Krishna in the center of our lives. So Vrindavan, to put Krishna, the holy name. As like I said, we're all chanting in Australia, and we're chanting in New Zealand, and someone's chanting in Malaysia and Fiji. And Africa and India and Europe, America, Russia, everywhere. Chanting, chanting, we're all chanting the same mantra, we're offering to the same Lord, we're hearing the same teachings, we're practicing the same process. I would say this way we're all packed up together. It appears physically that we're separated, but really we're not. We're all together in the same family and the same team. When more and more we put Krishna in the center of our lives, and more and more we put the instructions of the Lord's representative in the center of our lives, the more we'll feel we're together, protected, protected. So today we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, and I think it's the second chapter. We continue where we left off last week. So today, the verse number, Masika 23, is it? Is it 23 or 2? Um, I think it's 23, Major. 23. Okay, if you could... It's a long verse. And we've kind of moved on a little bit here. We have moved on from the uh, series of verses, which are very, let's say, prominent verses in this first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. 
foundational verses in the practice of devotional service. But every verse is, is essential. So we're moving on now to text 23. If you can share screen. Sadvam vajastamo iti prakrite gunas tire. Yukta parak purusha eka ihasya tate. Ditya de hari virinti hare ti sangya. Shreyam si tatrakahu. Satvatanarinam shuhu. And it's a very long verse, and it's quite a long purport also. So what we'll do is we will uh, go on to the translation, not go on the word for word. The translation. The Sutta Goswami is continuing to speak in response to the sages of Namishrana <clears throat> for the sake of the welfare of all living entities. And this verse today, the transcendental personality of Godhead is indirectly associated with the three modes of material nature, namely passion, goodness, and ignorance. And just for the material world's creation, maintenance, and destruction, he accepts the three qualitative forms of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Of these three, all human beings can derive ultimate benefit from Vishnu, the form of the quality of goodness. And purport. But Lord Sri Krishna <laughs> should be rendered devotional service, as explained above, is confirmed by this statement. Lord Sri Krishna and all of his plenary parts are Vishnu Tattva, or the Lordship of Godhead. From Sri Krishna, the next manifestation is Baladev. From Baladev is Sankarshan. From Sankarshan is Narayan. From Narayan, there is the second Sankarshan. And from this Sankarshan, the Vishnu Puru, Purusha avatars. The Vishnu, or the deity of the quality of goodness in the material world, is the Purusha avatar known as Shirodakshai Vishnu, or Paramatma. Brahma is the deity of rajas, passion, and Shiva of ignorance. They are the three departmental heads of the three qualities of this material world. Creation is made possible by the goodness of Vishnu. And when it requires to be destroyed, Lord Shiva does it by the Tandava Nritya. Boom, boom, this drum which he beats. The materialists and the foolish human beings worship Brahma and Shiva respect, respectively, but the pure transcendentalists worship the form of goodness, Vishnu, in his various forms. Vishnu is manifested by his millions and billions of integrated forms and separated forms. The integrated forms are called Godhead, and the separated forms are called the living entities or the jivas. Both the jiva and Godhead have their original spiritual forms. Jivas are sometimes subjected to the control of material energy. But the Vishnu forms are always controllers of this energy. When Vishnu, the supreme personality of Godhead, appears in the material wood, he comes to deliver the conditioned living beings who are under the material energy. Such living beings appear in the material world with intentions of being lords, and thus they become entrapped by the three modes of nature. As such, the living entities have to change their material coverings for undergoing different terms of imprisonment. The prison house of the material world is created by Brahma under instructions of the personality of Godhead, and at the conclusion of a kalpa, the whole thing is destroyed by Shiva. But as far as maintenance of the prison house is concerned, it is done by Vishnu. As much as the state prison house is maintained by the state, anyone therefore who wishes to get out of the prison house of material existence, which is full of miseries like repetition of birth, death, disease and old age, must please Lord Vishnu for such liberation. Lord Vishnu is worshipped by devotional service only. And if anyone has to continue prison life in the material world, 
excuse me. Um, yeah, he may ask for relative facilities for temporary relief from the different demigods like Lord Shiva, Brahma, Indra, and Varuna. No demigod, however, can release the imprisoned living being from the conditioned life of material existence. This can be done only by Vishnu. Therefore, the ultimate benefit may be derived from Vishnu, the personality of Godhead. Hare Krishna. Are you can, no, you know. Having heard in the previous verses the practically speaking the process of devotional service, we've heard about the nature of the absolute truth, the method to approach the absolute truth, the results of approaching the absolute truth. The one becomes freed of the effects of passion and ignorance lust and greed, anger and so on, and comes to the mode of goodness. And as we hear in today's verse, although the empowerment um, of Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva is himself, you could say, a category unto himself, Shiva Tattva, specific Jew, specific role in relationship to the Lord, in relationship to Sankarsham, um, but Lord Brahma and other demigods are empowered by the Lord, that um, position or that capacity to create the universe, the Visharga, the secondary creator, Lord Brahma, is none other than the potent expansion of the Lord. It's the Lord's potency which expands into his capacity to perform such a duty. Now, that potency of the Lord, to a certain degree, is imbued in every living entity. Every living entity has a certain capacity, however small that living entity appears to be. Nonetheless, it has some form of capacity to perform. It may be breathing, it may be walking or crawling or something or just existing. But that existence potency or that existence ability is there in the Lord and it is um, injected or Im imbued within the living entity. So every living entity in one sense, as this verse said, is a form of Vivinaksa, the Shvanksa, that's Krishna himself, the full Lord expands in various ways. And one of his expansions is the, um, uh, the Jiva Tattva, uh, his internal energy, marginal energy, external. So the marginal energy also has some of the qualities in minute proportion many of the qualities of God, but in very, very minute proportion. And they're manifested accordingly, just like light uh, is revealed according to the situation. If you have dark curtains, you can't see much light at all. If the curtains are very light, then the light comes through quite a lot. And if you have no curtains, it comes through more or less fully. So it's not so much the, the light or the truth, it's more or less the method of the coverings of the living entity or well, the consciousness of the living entity, how covered, or how it's covered. And some living entities, although they are by nature imbued with these qualities of Godhead in a minute proportion, are not very manifested. They're very, very covered. They're very dull. In the human life, we get a mixture, a mixture of coverings. Um, some people are more in the mode of goodness, which is not so covered. Those in the mode of ignorance are very, very covered, deep deeply in ignorance, then there's practically no light, They're like a child or embryo in the womb or something. There's practically no light and no sign, no way that this message of Krishna consciousness is easily penetrating into their dark consciousness. They're very covered. So, uh, and generally speaking, of course, Lord Shiva is known as the Lord of that particular mode of nature a mode of ignorance which shrouds the living entity, but still because he's an expansion part of the Supreme Lord, a specific partial expansion, say, of the Lord, um, with a specific nature and capacity, etc. Still, if one serves him or follows him, then there can be some definite benefits from that, if it's done properly. Lord Brahma is a little different. Generally speaking, Lord Brahma is a jiva, a living entity, a marginal 
marginal entities generally, but he's empowered with uh, a much greater capacity than normal. And that empowerment is an expansion of the Lord. The post is a, is a post. Lord Shiva in this material world uh, may also be seen in this regards, as we've been hearing here a little bit, like a post, but it's in one sense it's not it's an expansion of Lord Shiva to perform this particular role. He has his position beyond and above uh, the uh, manifested material world. Whereas Lord uh, Brahma is not uh, simply a post within the material world. It has no other function in the spiritual realm. As such, Lord Shiva is protector of the Dham. He has his own abode, Kailash, certain type of let's say service is rendered there um, it's kind of in between sometimes it's said not to spirit but Lord Brahma doesn't have such a, a position his position is well, he can be Acharya he's a Parama Parama Guru Narayana Brahma Madhu Sampradaya but the, it's a post it's a post it's not a person Lord Shiva is a person playing taking the role of a in the post of that person also in this world he expands of course in various ruder forms uh, to perform the various functions which he has to perform in this world on behalf of the Lord of Lord Vishnu uh, but Lord Brahma is a specific post simply for material creation Doesn't there is no creation in the spiritual world everything is eternally existent the spiritual world things come into being and they're also uh, destroyed at a certain point of time. Living entity is not. Living entity comes from Vishnu. He's a Tatastra Shakti. He's marginal, sometimes covered over by the material energy. And uh, Lord Brahma is a post, and some qualified living entity takes that post. Just like we have president, we have prime minister, minister, this thing, that thing. They're not, they are people taking that role, but the post. That's not their name. It's not like the person is always the prime minister. Maybe they're for some time as the prime minister. So Rama is a post for creative purposes and different living entities take that position when, as and when the qualification is there and then they're empowered by the Supreme Lord to perform that particular act of creation. Um, so that's one thing. But the main point Prabhupada emphasizes in this particular verse is above and beyond these uh, uh, Purusha, uh, Purusha avatars, uh, excuse me, Guna avatars, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, um, the Purusha avatars, of Vishnu, in his various forms, Karna Dakshai, Garbha Dakshai, Shiva Dakshai, Vishnu, um, who also are in relationship with the creation. Interesting to note how all the incarnations expansions, etc., etc., do come through Baladev. Lord Baladev is the source of them. That's his, the Lord's expansion for that real purpose of, of expanding the realm of the Lord's, um, let's say, majesty, in the case of Vaikuntha, in the case of the material world, expanding the um, uh, facilities for the living entities, probably uses the word of prison in this world, to create the prison and the various um, controllers of the prison and so on so residences there for the living entities who are inimical towards the Lord the Brahma Jyoti um, plane of, of uh, impersonal Brahman is, is also there there's the sun rays of the sun are there Brahma Jyoti is like the sun rays of the Lord's effulgence and living entities are full completely full of living entities are existing in that plane of, of uh, spiritual spiritual existence and like many 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 vaikuntha planets countless vaikuntha planets beyond and above floating in that brahman but beyond the material nature with countless living entities serving the lord in various ways of reverence worshiping in so many ways and then other other planes of, of, of relationship are there in ayodhya and Nilachal and various other planes are there. Devotees rendering various forms of service to the Lord until one comes to um, the spiritual abode of Krishna himself, Krishna Loka. And within Krishna Loka, there are so many different planes also of 
of rasa, relationship, and even, even form relationship, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there's a portion of Bolok, Shretadvip, where the Lord is also performing his eternal pastimes in the mood of Goranga Mahaprabhu. Um, but primarily, the, the pastimes of Krishna are unlimited, unending, and that above. He's the source of everything. He's the source of Brahma and Vishnu, the source of the material energy. He's the source of the spiritual, he's the source of Balaram. Everything's expanded from him. You can say, although there's no creation, he is nonetheless the source of the sun, is the source of the rays of the sun. But they both existed more or less simultaneously. You can't really trace that out. But they're, they're coexisting. So the Lord and his internal abode is coexisting. It's not that there was nothing and then some another nothing decided to have something. No, they all eternally exist. This is a very hard concept for those who are conditioned to relativity in this world. The spiritual realm is eternal. So everything about it is eternal. And Krishna's pastimes, everything eternal. Eternally going on. And they're full of bliss, of course. But well, Krishna is a real maintainer because the life and soul of all living entities. We exist only because of him. We continue to exist only because of him. We may desire or not desire, but because of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, everything's going on. But he employs or he delegates, he empowers other living entities to perform, especially in relationship to the material creation, to perform the various or necessary activities within the material creation to facilitate the purpose of this material creation, which is not just to punish the errant souls or to facilitate their aspiration to try to enjoy themselves. But it's primarily existing to give the living entities a chance to renovate or reawaken their relationship with Godhead or with Krishna. But most people don't know this and most people are not interested in this. Therefore, is a nice verse in Atopasanam Sukshat Bhakti Yoga Dhoksha Jay that the unwanted attachments, material contaminations, etc., which cover the living entity are superfluous. They're nothing really to do with it. We, we, unfortunately, we identify ourselves with these various coverings in the form of bodies and minds and so on and things around us. We identify with this and thus we become implicated, entangled in the illusion of the material world. It's called Maya, and that which is not. We identify ourselves with that which is not. It's called Maya. But that's not the purpose of the material world, just to facilitate that mentality. That we just become further and further entangled in the material world. And we identify, but rather to change that. Now, Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, not to say they cannot, and the demigods, some of them may also be great, but their role is not exactly that. To some extent, but not entirely. Their main role is really just to facilitate, to even supply the needs of those within this material universe, the conditioned souls. Whereas Lord Vishnu, who's ultimately the supplier, he's the maintainer. He's the one keeping everything going on behind everything. But... Um, his real purpose ultimately is maintenance of goodness to bring people or conditioned souls to goodness. And he alone can give deliverance from this entanglement of the material world. He alone, Mukunda, he is the giver of liberation. No one else can ultimately give that. Lord Shiva can take one to Shiva Lok. Lord Brahma, in the role of a, of a pure devotee, that's something else. But in his role as the administrator, universal creator, excuse me. Um, that's not his role. That's not his role. He has another role, spiritual, that's no problem. But in terms of the actual duty of Brahman, his role is simply in the mood of creation and keeping everything going along in that way. And Lord Vishnu's mode of goodness, maintaining everything we do has this characteristic. We build something and that requires passion. And, but, and we destroy it maybe at a certain point in time. That, that's the mode of ignorance. But to maintain it, we can take, for instance, a relationship between a man and a woman. 
Um, there may be other ways of looking at it, no doubt, but in one sense, they're coming together as passion, attraction, desire. They come together. And as we see in many cases now, separation is also very prominent in mode of ignorance. But to maintain that relationship does take goodness, takes the mode of goodness. So that really means turning to Lord Vishnu, turning to, towards Krishna, and everything else comes into perspective, comes into balance. Anyway, this is within the material realm, and Prabhupada is emphasizing here that the worship of Lord Vishnu, the worship of Lord Krishna alone can satisfy. And we hear that from the previous verse, his own unalloyed devotional service to the Supreme Lord, Yayatma Supasiddhati. Ahoitikya Apatyataya Yatma Supasiddhati. Only that unalloyed, unmotivated devotion to Vishnu or Krishna can satisfy the self. Everything else is only a temporary arrangement. All the benedictions of the, of the demigods, all the statements of the Vedic literatures almost exclusively lead to only a temporary situation. Um, where Srimad Bhagavatam is the subject matter to help us to understand our eternal nature. A claim that we never have to return to this material world, as Krishna says. One who understands this transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not have to take birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode. And this is the purpose of the prison house. And those serious about wanting to get out should turn to the proprietor, not to just one of the agents within the prison. They may be a nice guy or not a nice guy. But uh, that won't release one. They may put in a good word for us, but they of themselves cannot release us from this maya. Maya is very strong. Very hard to overcome. But those who surrender unto me can cross beyond it easily. Surrender to the Lord. We have to know who to surrender to. Who to surrender to. And sometimes... People surrender to Lord Vishnu, not so much to Lord Brahma, we don't hear much about that, but especially to Lord Shiva. In one sense, okay, but in another sense, not, because the tendency is that uh, one stays at that station, one doesn't really appreciate or understand the nature of Krishna, immersion in his Bhuan, or whatever it may be, or misunderstanding what it means to surrender to Lord Vishnu, or one ends up as the Lord Shiva. One ends up imitating instead of following. As probably gives example many times, our Lord Shiva swallowed the the uh, uh, the poison which was uh, produced from the churning of the milk ocean by the demons and demigods. And poison, a lot of poison produced, and Lord Shiva himself personally um, swallowed that poison. But some of the poisons were uh, dropped from spilling out of his hands as he swallowed it. And thus we have all kinds of poisonous creatures in this world today. Um, as a result of that, poisonous plants, insects, animals, and so on and so forth. Um, so we, that also represents the uh, taking of toxics or intoxications also comes in that way. Um, and uh, we try to imitate Lord Shiva by taking intoxication while well, he swallowed an ocean of poison and to take a little bit of poison in the form of some kind of drug or alcohol or something. His imitation is a very tiny, tiny little thing, proportionate to our size. But we don't imitate. If one imitates Lord Shiva, then that is condemned. But if one follows Lord Shiva's path of devotion, he is after all Vaishnavan and Patar Shambhu is considered to be the greatest Vaishnava also. So we follow his path. How does that mean? Well, there are certain, you don't have to see, but in various Puranas and statements, Lord Shiva has given so many instructions, even in the worship of Lord Krishna. So many prayers that even in the Bhagavatam, we find Lord Shiva glorifying Krishna. We follow his path. Um, he's also a charya. He's also one of the 12 Mahajans, great souls who can teach the path of religion, the path of perfection. But Lord Vishnu alone is the um, 
ultimate objective is the ultimate goal and he is the he's a source of matter a source of spirit source of everything and then the wise person will take shelter from because all one's desires will be fulfilled it doesn't mean they're going to be fulfilled in the sense of i got my rolex watch i got my bmw i got my husband my wife my this my that no but what is it they were searching for? What is the jiva searching for? The jiva is searching for that self-content, that happiness within the heart. He wants to be happy because that's the quality of God. And he's full of bliss. So the living entity is also searching for that experience because it's constitutional to be blissful. It is not constitutional to be in anxiety, stress, fear, etc. These are not constitutional emotions or experiences. In the material world, they are. The spiritual world, for instance, is sat, eternal. The material world is asset. The spiritual world is full of knowledge, full of knowledge. And the material world is full of ignorance. People are everything, everywhere. Ignorance is affecting everything. The spiritual world is, is eternal. The material world is not. The spiritual world is blissful. Material world is a mixed reflection of happiness and distress. Um, like that is asat, where's the spiritual world is sat, it's near ananda, where's the spiritual world is ananda, and it's achit, where's the spiritual world is chit, or full of cognizance, full of knowledge. There's no ignorance there. Everyone's fully aware of their situation in terms of, you know, they're not thinking of being something else. People don't know who they are in this material, what they speak of, how to enjoy. No idea how to enjoy. They're trying various methods they're inventing to try to enjoy. But the real pleasure is when we're with Krishna, when we connect with Krishna. And Lord Brahma, if you approach him in a devotional mood, will connect, try to connect us with Krishna, ultimately, or Shiva, the same thing. So their roles are very great. But the main thing is to come to Krishna, to surrender to Krishna. In the purport, Shiva Prabhupada. Excellent. Mm. I covered a lot of it, I think. Um, yeah. Anyway, we pretty much briefly covered most of the points of this purpose, as far as I can see. Um, okay, well, we have. Two more classes today here in Zurich. We have one already, and now this one, and two more coming up. So, and we had a late night program last night, and uh, we may have to catch up on a few things today. So, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. You're most welcome. There's a one question that's come or two. Vindavan Dham. Lord Brahma is both mentioned as a pure devotee of Lord Vishnu and an administrator of the material world. He is said to not be able to give liberation because he doesn't have it. However, he has residence in Varshan and has had darshan of the Lord who gives immediate liberation and pure attraction for him. Not give it in the sense that he naturally, Charya, Guru, sometimes in relationship to the material world, he may not seem to be always acting in that understanding. He appeared to be an illusion when he came to or saw the pastimes in Vrindavan, Krishna stealing her mother, or any of the pastimes, Krishna having picnics on the bank of Jamuna, killing a Gasura, and so on, quite astonishing. And it appears that Lord Brahma misunderstood. I wanted to uh, do a bit overwhelmed with pride. Um, so we see these things, because there's more to it than that, much more. But that's his role when he's in an administrative role. Um, he's, he's a great devotee of the Lord, may sometimes play the role of Bhakti Vinod Dakur did as a chief magistrate. And when he's playing that role, he has to behave like a chief magistrate. He can behave, he may be able to perform it more expertly, but it basically he has to act as a chief magistrate in that role. 
a parent may act in a certain role with a child. We play our role. Now, as you say, in another situation, he has residence in Varshan, he has residence here and there. He's in Brahma Samhita, the beautiful prayers which were adored by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, emanated from Lord Brahma. And there are many, many others. And if you think carefully, it's different situations. Now, what we're, what we're hearing here, too, don't forget, is that Brahma is a post. It's a post. It's not that that is his eternal name, his eternal business. That's a post that he may perform. We see this sometimes in the material world, that great devotees take various posts in this world, as Brahma, sometimes as Surya, sun god as Yamaraj. We see Yamaraj, for instance, was, you know, he had to do his duty as Yamaraj. He's a pure devotee of the Lord. And he took the position of Vidura in order to perform devotional service within in, in a more direct form and not sort of indirect by doing what the Lord wants you to do in the material world, conditional service in this world. Um, but in a more direct way, as a preacher, as a dura, as a preacher of the glories of the Lord. So sometimes they do that also. They sometimes expand into this world to perform particular duties to facilitate the Lord's pastimes, to facilitate the mission of the Lord, and the business of the Lord in this world, and the prison warder in this world, um, so to speak. Um, so they may do things like that. Um, but at the same time, when the situation arises, they can also act in a different way, as a man may act in a different way at home than he does in the court, or when he's driving his car, or when he's on playing sport, or worshipping, or whatever the person does, they may behave differently. So in the case of devotional service, Lord Brahma, when that comes to, will also give all good directions to the living entities how to progress spiritually. Uh, not just to facilitate the living entities' desires and karmas within this world, but how to advance spiritually. We can do that, for sure. But as far as giving liberation is concerned, the prison warder may be very good, giving good advice to the prisoners. He may even, to the point where he recommends them, please release this prisoner, but he doesn't have the power in of himself to release the prisoner. He may know all that needs to be known, but he doesn't have that ability. That is alone. This is Krishna's energy. We are Krishna's energy. Everything belongs to Krishna. Everything is his energy. And ultimately, it depends wholly and solely on the will of the Lord. But his will is, let's say, influenced, considerably influenced, if not entirely influenced, by the will of the pure devotees, by the will of his representatives, no matter who they are, by their will, by their sincere desire, because they're very dear to the most dear to the Lord, more dear than his very self. By their will, um, Krishna feels well, he's naturally he's, he's obligated to fulfill the will of his pure devotees because they have no material desires. They're not asking for anything for themselves. They just desire for Krishna's pleasure that all the living entities should be delivered and go back to God. So like Prabhupada in his Makine Bhagavad Dharma, is praying to the Lord, please, my Lord, only by your will can they be delivered. But it is my will that you please deliver them. He can't do it on his own. But by the will of the pure devotee is that which influences the will of Krishna. This is the point. So they are not necessarily able to give like that. Can't do it because they're not the ultimate controller. This energy doesn't belong to them. They're just acting on behalf of the Lord. But by their great will, this devotee is so wonderful, my dear Lord. Please, please deliver him from them. Please take them back to God. So the appeal of the pure devotees is the, which touches the Lord's heart. And that's the trigger for the Lord's will to deliver the living entity. And so surely such great devotees are eternally residing. They can do both. And there, don't forget, there's not just one Brahma, there's countless universes and, and every, you know, uh, every cycle, every, and every breath of or another Brahma is coming out. There are countless Brahmas, countless Brahmas. So sometimes, I'm not saying it is, but sometimes 
sometimes these, uh, let's say, statements, past time existing, that thing, are from different millenniums with different personalities. Same with Indra. Indra is a post also. All these positions of demigods are post occupied by certain persons for a period of time to perform a particular duty. Even though they may be pure devotees or not pure devotees, but the post is, is to be performed according. You have to play that role. As a, as a judge, a judge may be a very kind, pious person, devotional, and it may be his own family member. They usually don't do that, but if they have his own family member, they still judge them according to the particular law. Uh, and it's the nature of a Madhyamari carry also, they have to discriminate somehow. Right? Even if they are on the highest platform of Uttama, they still have to discriminate for the sake of the purpose, the purpose of uh, preaching Krishna consciousness. So that's a little bit anyway about Lord Brahma and uh, many of these great devotees. Next one. As Lord Brahma is a Jiva Tat, the living entity who is prone to fall into illusion, how can we have confidence in his treatise, Brahma Samhita? How can we be reassured he was not an illusion when speaking? <laughs> Good one. <laughs> well, then we'd have to say Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is an illusion also, <laughs> because he relished reading this, uh, at least the fifth chapter of the Brahma Samhita. I haven't read the other chapters, so I can't comment. But this chapter, he absolutely relished. Daily, practically speaking, this Krishna Karnamita, Brahma Samhita, the scriptures were very, very dear to Lord Chaitanya. And all the Vaishnavas, Prabhupada, would sing this every day when the daily meetings take place. Govindam Hari Purushan. Prabhupada himself used to recite and sing these prayers. When we do puja, we recite these prayers. We mean everybody is, is indeed, including Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in illusion. Or uh, be, and that's, that's the whole process is an illusion. <laughs> so if you don't accept these prayers, then we have to accept the whole process. We have to reject the whole process basically because these prayers are very tantamount in, in, the, in the practice of devotional service to the extent where Prabhupada said we should learn these prayers like like, like um, Brahma Samhita and others in order so that it will always vibrate, reverberating in our consciousness. Kintamani Prakasatma Sukalpa Briksha. We can also find that all the these particular verses they are completely corroborated or um, um, confirmed by the Vaishnav scriptures, at least uh, the conclusions of the Brahma Samhita are so distinct and deep, but they're all confirmed in the uh, in the Brahma in the Bhagavatam and other scriptures like that. They're not just another form of philosophy or another opinion. They're just furthering or deepening the understanding of the nature of Godhead. So, therefore, Vaishnava accept these as authorized prayers. When Brahma goes into illusion, just like some of Krishna's eternal associates, as we say, don't forget, there are not, Brahma is not like one a person only, eternally, and that's it. There are countless universes with Brahmas in, and even, and you know, of course, in this particular, you could say, uh, daytime, or lifetime, or whatever you want to call it, um, there's only one Brahma, or one person taken that long. He lives a long time. But in eternity, that isn't a very long time. It's just a flick of nothing. Countless Brahmas are there. Countless Brahmas. At different degrees, they may be more advanced or less advanced. Just like Jai and Vijay, they are eternal associates of the Lord, but they appear to be demons in this material. They're playing a role on behalf of the Lord to fulfill the Lord's desires. They play roles. Even Nanda and, 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 uh, and Yasoda, they expand themselves as Drona and Dara into this world to teach the process of developing the mood of Vatsalya Bhav. And then when Lord Narananda and Yasoda appear, they merge into the, back into their original forms. But that doesn't mean the original form doesn't exist. Lashvanath Chakravarti describes how Jai and Vijay continue as Jai and Vijay, even when they fell down as Hiranyakashipu. It wasn't like there was a hole there. No, they continued. 
in this, the term of spiritual world, they expanded themselves as Ranya Kashipu and Ranyaksha. Baba says, don't think anyone who thinks that this happens in every millennium is in illusion. It's only happened once for the sake of the Lord's particular past time there. And other times when giant, when it appears Ranya Kashipu and they Baba said they're actually demons, they're not ordinary. They're they're all what's it ordinary? They're like Jivas who attain that position. So sometimes the demigods are eternal associates, sometimes they're Jivas. Sometimes the Lord Himself takes that role. It's a post, and the post has to be performed. The duty has to be performed. Like it or lump it, you have to do Arjuna didn't want to fight, but he had to do it. It was his duty to do that. And before that duty. So sometimes they fall down, appear to fall down by the arrangement of the Lord's energies. If they're not pure devotees, it may be their own will. And if they're pure devotees, there's two ways of falling down. One by the arrangement of the Lord, one is by her own, we could say, will. Um, in this case, the arrangement of the Lord, the will is for the man, um, and so on and so forth. Purposeful to show Lord Brahma's first thoughts were. Let me do something now which will prove to one and all that Krishna alone is the supreme amongst everyone. Not me, not Shiva, no other demigod. He is the supreme. So let me do something which will help prove this. That was his initial thought. Then he went to the illusion of thinking he could challenge Krishna. He could show off in front of Krishna. So different reasons are there. From our perspective, it looked as a, a warning about becoming forced, forced pride and thinking we are, you know, great or something like that. Krishna smashes it as he smashed the pride of Indra, he smashed the pride of Brahma, even Lord Shiva, in a sense, to show that, he, you know, that ultimately he is the supreme one, the source of everything, a worshipful personality, the, the ultimate resort, etc., etc. Next one. What good, what does complete surrender to Sri Krishna mean? Well, let me know when you when you when you, when you realize it. Huh? Oh, there's another one before that. There's, uh, two, three. What is the ultimate position? Okay, let's go back. Ultimate position. <laughs> what is the ultimate position? Just let me drink some apple juice. <laughs> It's a very wonderful, deep topic, subject matter. And we have everything emanating from Krishna. Everything has its purpose. It's not a random kind of thing, you know, like, like you know, uh, we may pass air or burp or something. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not like that. Everything, that. everything about Krishna is perfect. And all the various expansions, both Jiva and otherwise, the internal expansions, the external, everything, is perfect. Om punam madak punamidam punak punamadachite punasya punamadaya punamedavashishite. We sometimes chant this verse from Ishopanishad. Everything is perfect, complete in itself. So everything emanating from the complete is also perfect. So everything that emanates from Krishna is perfect. Perfect. Uh, and, and Krishna is the ultimate. So, in one sense, when everything is playing its part according to its position according to what Krishna's will is for that particular emanation that's the ultimate position it may be appear different now one devotee may say that no and we see this all the time Lord Chaitanya when he was in Sri Rangam he had long you can read in Chaitanya Charitamrita discussions with Venkata Bhatt on the relative absolute if you want to call it relative but absolute position of Lord worship in Aishwarya Bhav and that in Madhurya Bhav, the worship of Lakshmi Narayan, the worship of Radha Krishna, and but for Venkatabhat, the worship of Lakshmi Narayan is ultimate. You see, that's his nature. And uh, of course, we're not in a position to analyze our own situation probably at this stage, but in the absolute sense, yes, although there will be nobody left in Vaikuntha. <laughs> you could say, well, is that a loss? Well, Krishna's expanded in that way. There's another aspect of his personality that he hasn't expanded. He doesn't need to. He could, just, he could expand in a way that on living entities only have a particular ras or only in a particular mood. Um, but he hasn't. It's a variety, it's a spice of life. 
So he's expanding these various ways for various reasons of his own. And consequently, he's never alone. So there are countless uh, living entities who are also expansions of the Lord. They may be Vibhinang or, you know, servitor, servitor, servitor um, expansions um, in that particular mood. And, and it would be, would be uh, wrong for them to uh, not serve the Lord in that particular mood. That's their nature, Hanuman's nature. He can't become a gopi. It would be wrong. It's totally ludicrous. His nature is that's his perfection. That's his ultimate perfection. Is to serve Krishna, in, serve Ram Chandra in that role, to serve Lord Narayan in that particular role, to serve Lord Narsimhadev in that particular role. It's their ultimate perfection. But that would depend on an individual living entity and what that is. We're created, or we, let's say we have, creation infers beginning. We have a particular nature. Now, the unique thing is, we do hear, of course, that the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come with a specific aspect, um, let's say, of, of, uh, of giving this ultimate perfection that through the Sangatan movement. Oh, all fruits can come. All fell, all fruit, this word fell was mentioned this morning. All fruits can come from this tree of devotional service, whatever they are. If the living entity does desire, for whatever in constitutional or whatever it may be, reason to taste apples when it's a pear tree, he will have apples. When you go before Lord Jagannath, different devotees, they have a different vision of Godhead, and they, the Lord Jagannath reciprocates with that particular devotee. Uh, many stories of them. So similarly in the spiritual realm or in the process of devotional service, the Lord reciprocates. As they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. So if one is, by the grace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, what are we to speak about the details of this? But by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, nothing is impossible. Transformation can even take place. Although even there we see in the example of, of the brother of Rupa and Sanata, Anupam, he could change his, his uh, bhav, his eternal associate of Lord Ram. He could, he knew, but also knew that the relationship you know, of Madhurya Ras, Vatsalya Ras, in Goloka Vrindavan, Sakya Ras, is higher in terms of his intensity of loving reciprocation. It's sweeter, much sweeter, much more imbued with various, you know, characteristics of loving exchange etc more pleasing in one sense but if you get give an example for instance if you're in the court if the wife comes into the court and starts having a loving relationship with her husband it would be completely inappropriate it would almost be against the law she would probably be escorted out of the court even though it's the husband of the, of the, of the chief justice or, the, or whatever he is the magistrate whatever he is it's inappropriate. It doesn't fit. And there's a place for every type of mood, of every type of relationship. And when that situation, there's no oh, conscious involvement, even in Goloka Vrindavan. I mean, when the coward boys are in the forest enjoying coward pastimes or eternal pastimes, but there's no, they're not, you know, they're completely absorbed. There's no Mother Yasoda there. She doesn't have that mood. Even the gopis are not there. There, there's, a, there's a, it's just not even, you know, it doesn't come in, you know, it's like there's a different, different uh, plane of last time going on, and that's perfect. We're living into the thing, oh God, why did he end up as a coward boy when I could have been a gopi? I just said the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's not like that at all. It's complete, perfect and complete. Per everything, perfect and complete. So when we say ultimate, Ultimate means everything is perfectly connected to Krishna's will. All varieties of rasas, all varieties of service, although there appears to be higher and lower, and indeed we could say there are in terms of the intensity, but all of them are important to Krishna. The Lord Chaitanya put more emphasis on the Madhurya Ras, no doubt about that. Some of our acharyas or acharyas may have put more emphasis on other rasas. Balabha Sampadaya more on the Vitalia Bhav, 
and some others on the Sakya Bhav, others mostly on the Dasya Bhav, and some on the Shanta Bhav. But uh, Madhuri Ras contains everything that's contained within all the other Rasas. So that for, in that sense, is the most complete. Complete, more complete, most complete. But they're all perfect and they're all ultimate, ultimate for those devotees in that particular mood, in that particular rasa. Next one. Um, read that. How to avoid offenses in the dam? Uh, the, the devotee just on his way to the dam right now. What should be our attitude when visiting Vrindavan and other holy places? Wonderful uh, meditation on Sri Vrindavan Dham. Take the dust. Respect everyone. Serve the devotees, serve the cows. Keep chanting. Keep chanting, chanting, chanting. Try to this mood of humility. Especially I find serving the cows. They're dumb buses. Any living entity. So be in this mood how we, how we can serve. We don't be very careful with our materialistic conditioning to judge. Don't judge. I mean, you have to use look on the sense, obviously. But don't judge people according to how we see them materially. Be very cautious to see it as Krishna's mercy to help us see everything as Krishna's mercy to help us to see our own anartas. When we see anartas or something, and it's like Prabhupada said to Kirtananda in 67, Kirtananda Swami at that time, he said to Prabhupada, why is everything dirty? Why is Vrindavan? He had this material vision, Vrindavan would be like, you know, heavenly planet or something. Everything just perfect, material. But he didn't see it like that. Dirt, scrawny dogs, you know, barking at you and, Dust everywhere and hot, and people pestering you for donations. And it just doesn't look what we conceived of as Vrindavan, broken buildings. And Prabhupada said, You're seeing it like dirty, like this, because your heart is dirty. So see it, everything like that. It's Krishna. We can't see Sri Krishna Ramadi. We can't see the transcendental realm with our material senses. But if we have this humble, this respectful attitude, uh, then and to understand that everything Krishna's arranging, whatever we can see, or whatever we do experience, is to help purify our heart. Now on the other side, not on the other side, but on another perspective, keep careful association with our imperfect vision and our sentimental approaches, etc., etc. We may we may not get the right understanding, the right perspective. So try to keep uh, as good association as we can. That's why Srila Prabhupada created the Krishna Bharam temple. It's not that there aren't pure devotees here and there, much more than I am, that's for sure. No, no limits there. But uh, the Krishna Bharam temple was to give us that protection. Because in there, the emphasis is on the deity. The emphasis is to sang, the sangha. To hear and chant about Krishna. Prabhupada well, gave us an embassy. It's like an embassy to the spiritual world. Within the, whatever we have, understanding of the presence of Vrindavan Dham. But within that, there's this embassy, which even persons who are not eligible are able to take shelter in that embassy and understand or become eligible to enter into the Dham. So as much as you can, stick with devotees um, who are under the shelter of Srila Prabhupada. And there may be many others, they're not monopoly, but th this is our safe zone, especially, especially when we're in the Dham, to keep under the, the protection. We're supposed to serve in Vrindavan under the protection, under the shelter of an eternal associate of Vrindavan. So we serve under Prabhupada's shelter. And that way you'll be less likely to get carried away by the, the tendency to commit offenses, to misunderstand, and so on, for materialistic tendencies to become prominent. Less likely. Less likely. 
and as much kirtan as you can, as much chanting as you can, and as much service as we can. We may, especially in the beginning, we're not necessarily on the platform where we can sit and just and sit and absorb ourselves in bhajan. But we can do kirtan, we can serve, we can hear, and so on like this. We go with the goes on Parikrama, better to go with the goddess. We go on our own, and attend to this, whatever, anything possible can happen. More shelter, more protection, more safe for the neophyte devotee to stay in the presence of those who are a little more advanced and to at least develop an appreciation for Vrindavan beyond and above our mundane perspective or perception or our dreams of what Vrindavan should be, but to enter into what is really Vrindavan. And that comes up, I think, in the next question as well. Let me see. Um, what does complete surrender mean? Your attitude, probably one time said about attitude, we can also hear. We, when we first went to Vindavan, as we were entering, we read the prayers of a guru. Brother said it should be the attitude also of a devotee when they enter Vindavan. So you can read that too. Um, what does complete surrender mean? To Krishna. Well, in one sense, it's an easy question to answer. It means just like re reviving our or uh, uh, being in our constitutional position. That's all. Simple as that. It's not like some kind of application of behavior. It's realizing our actual nature. That's surrender. When we accept our actual nature. Right now, we're trying to establish a false nature according to our karma and condition in this world. When we accept our acts like Arjuna accepted his actual nature to serve the will of Krishna. Surrender. Giving up his conditioned perspective of fighting or not fighting and reasons why or not to do it. But he surrendered whatever you want me to do, Krishna. So that's the beginning of our constitutional relationship, we could say, whatever you want me to do. But uh, whatever angle we look at it, um, because that can be discussed also by those who are more qualified. But the position of the living entity, when the hand plays its part, is perfect. When it tries to imitate the foot, it is not perfect. It plays its part. So when the living entity plays its part properly, in an orchestra, when you play your part properly, perfect. If you don't, it's a mess. I see when it's cooperation there with the, with the owner of the body or with the conductor of the orchestra, you get harmony, you get perfection. So similarly, the living entity, when playing our part in relation with Krishna, we're learning to do that in the material world. So when we play our part here in the practicing stage, that's preparing us for in the constitutional stage, to play our proper part in relation with Krishna. For that which we're meant, that which is what Krishna's will, so this is to be, uh, let's say, existing simply for the pleasure of Krishna, as we're meant to be. So when your hand acts according to a hand, you are happy. When it doesn't and it rejects whatever the command we give the hand, it's, we're not in a happy state. If we say, pick up the spoon, the hand says, stuff it. I'm not going to pick up the spoon. Then that's not going to satisfy us. There's some problem there. Maybe you've got some disease or something. So we're in a disease condition. So learning this process of playing our part, that's all. It's not so that's surrender. Accepting our part. It's not some kind of forced kind of activity of, or nu a numerical achievement. It may be related, but it's not itself necessary at all surrender. It may be for another objective goal. We may have some false ego or whatever it may be. But to let go of that and to act according to our real ego is surrender. Uh, let's see. I uh, didn't know. How. Who is this? No, it's great. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, it's the same, same question again. How can we tell if fall down or offense is due to our own tendencies or influence from others or influence of the three modes of past life karma. We're already fallen. 
And when we talk about fall, <laughs> we're, in one sense, I can't, we're already fallen. And when we have this mentality that we are fallen, then you can't really fall. But if you think you're not fallen, then the danger of fall comes in. Practical side of it. It's not due to the influence of the three modes of nature exactly. They're instruments. You don't blame a knife for when you cut yourself with a knife. As far as you shouldn't do anyway. Damn that knife. The knife cut me, right? I'm going to destroy this knife. But that's not very intelligent. That's a misunderstanding of what really is going on. The knife didn't cut us. We used the knife, and for whatever reason, we made a mistake and we got cut by the knife. But we're responsible for it, not the knife. See, the three modes of nature, past life karma. Okay, well, they're acting out, you could say, our karma. But fall down is, and when we're talking of fall down, we're already falling in the material world. That's another thing. It's not due to karma. We become implicated. Maybe it looks like we're more fallen, but we're fallen in this world by desire. It's not by karma. It's not by, you go to the court, damn that magistrate, he sentenced me to prison. You know, I'll get my revenge on him. No. The judge is just accordingly reciprocating what you've done and why you've done it, because you have some desire to do it. And that may be influenced, of course, in the material world by one's past activity, but it ultimately goes to the soul, to the living entity being responsible for the situation where we are responsible for our own situation, not somebody else. There may be so many other persons come in and because we met them, we thought we did this. But why did we meet them in the first place? Oh, it's my past karma, but why have you got your karma like that in the first, beyond that? It ultimately goes back to the living entity. It's not, you can, there's no point blaming karma this lifetime or previous lifetimes. It's her own conscious desire, will, it needs to be changed. Everything else will fall into place. Now, that doesn't mean, therefore, all karmas will then adjust and you'll suddenly find yourself fixed in a mode of goodness with no problems, completely peaceful. That's, that's external. Internally, we accept that whatever situation we find ourselves in, whether it's directly due to karma or the arrangement of the Lord, whatever it may be, the devotee sees beyond that. He understands you are very merciful. This is a situation which is due to me, whether it's from karma or whatever. I deserve more than this. You are very merciful when the devotee takes shelter of Krishna. This is a change that's required. Instead of trying to just analyze the reasons for this and the reason, we become very much implicated in, an, in, in, in most cases, an imperfect endeavor. Imperfect. Because who are we to be able to analyze all these things? Very, even Lord Brahma, even great personalities find it difficult to understand the workings of karma, the workings of this world, although they themselves are participating in the production of it, the maintenance of it is actually coming from Krishna. And who can understand the mind of Krishna? So this may be a reflection. We're in the reflection. Do you blame a reflection when you look in the mirror? And you see a pimple on your mouth, on your face. You see your eyes all crinkled uh, down like this. Damn this mirror. And you smash the mirror. Okay. Gone. Can't see it anymore. Fantastic. No more pimples. No, they're still there. You just can't see them. So. They're not like that. It's the, the, it's the pimples here, not on the mirror. It's just a reflection. So the reflections we see in this material world are reflections of Ultimately, the spiritual world, but we're seeing them perverted because of our own perverted nature. So we have to change our consciousness, not everything around us. How we see, Bhakti Sadhana said, we have to change how we see things, not what we see. The environment may help us to do that, and it should do. That's why society, human society is arranged to help facilitate that change. But it's not dependent upon the environment. The environment is to facilitate, help facilitate it. Uh, so we don't karma, all these things are external. What's the other one you mentioned? Tendencies due to influence from others, whether it's all due to the will of the Lord is 
guiding everyone. We meet with certain persons to give us opportunities to advance or to become further entangled. We have to take responsibility for those choices. But the devotee, one who's a little bit more mature than we are, um, acts in such a way to help us not to make choices which further entangle us or cause us to fall away from devotional service if we're practicing devotion. They always try to help. So the help of a Vaishnava, Vaishnavas is essential in this regards to protect us from more likelihood of falling down from the practice of devotion. So important is association of the Buddhas is our shelter. This is our shelter. They engage us in service. They engage us in chanting and hearing. They help us to uh, avoid the mind dragging us away through maybe by preaching or by their loving association, etc. Try to help us not to be con the intelligence, not to be controlled by the mind. At their stage, these are kind of like relevant things for a pure devotee. <laughs> doesn't mean anything but for a condition so yes oh my mind's overcoming my intelligence and i feel like i gotta go you know i can't take this anymore and the devotee comes along you know what's up problem you don't look like you're very you look a little bit disturbed are you okay oh it's no 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 my mind and i don't wow you know, go on and on and the devotee tries to help us so the association of devotees is very important when you associate with persons who are not interested in devotion so if they're they will in either reawaken this doubt in your heart or they will help to uh, further that doubt in such a way that we'll become sometimes convinced, yes, uh, this is, I was cheated or I was crazy or these people, or whatever, you go on and on like this. And you go back to Maya for some time. But it's not caused by that. They're just facilitating. It's like if someone's born in a particular family, it's not by chance. We tend to blame our parents, blame this. They've got their problems and they've got what they've got because of what they've done and what they desire. And we've got what we've got because of what we've done and what we desire. And we're born in a certain family which has, you know, the right karma to uh, bring up our tenancies, our desires due to our past business and previous lifetimes. And it comes up in their association. It's already there. It just comes to the surface, doesn't it? Like churning the milk ocean, it comes already there, it just comes up by a certain mixture, it comes out. So, like that. So, the real thing is our own perspective, our own perception, our own consciousness. That's what really counts. So, to try to change that, everything else, <clears throat> nothing else then is, is, is the thing <clears throat> going to overcome the, uh, the consciousness at all. But when our consciousness is still, still very weak very fragile and definitely we need strong association protection in different ways reminding regularly strong sadhana though it is easy to get carried away because of our lifetimes of conditioning and the association of the world around us and sometimes even the name of devotees devotees mislead us and bring us into the mood of criticizing into the mood of fault finding into the mood of rejection of authority so many different things crop up in our hearts, new age stuff, all sorts of things become over, a kind of overcoating pure devotion. And thus we become boom, 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 further and further away in the objective goal, which we started with. We're not here to accommodate our conditioning, we're here to uh, change it, not to accommodate it. Sometimes you want to, oh, we're not here to justify our fallen condition, we're here to get free of our fallen condition, which is not a condition externally, it's an internal way of looking at things, which causes it to remain. Stop, stop looking at them, stop blaming others, stop seeing, you know, this is a result of this, that, and the other, because that will keep us in this mood of independence, in this mood of um, a conditional mood. We'll always be looking for an answer materially. The only answer is within that we've forgotten Krishna, that we're still seeing ourselves as the enjoyer, we're still seeing the world around us as mine or somewhere I, I'm from or I do enjoy it or something or another should be adjusted. All these are signs of conditional perspective or perception. It needs to be changed. Next time. Okay.
Okay, thank you all very much, Hare Krishna. We're going to finish there now because we do have a few more classes coming up today, I believe. And uh, we thank you very much once again for your wonderful association. Two or three days left of Kartik and uh, Kartels, Kartels, Kartik, Kartels. Uh, take advantage of these last two or three days. They are very wonderful opportunities for everyone, and including devotees, although devotees may be fully engaged every day. Still, there's extra special mercy in these days. These singing the Damodarastakam, worshipping Shishi. When you sing Radha Damodar or Yasoda Damodar, both pastimes exist. But that mood, the mood of pure unalloyed devotion, which is developed expressed in various ways in these Damodarastakam prayers, which are according to their acharyas, but really, really important to sing and try to enter into the mood of these. Together we sing together, entering into the mood of Damodarastakam. Well, it would have been nice to have finished with Damodarastakam, actually. And that's quite a big ordeal. That would take us a long time. We could sing it all together. If you put it on the screen, you don't have to repeat or sing it together. Put it on the screen. Damodarastakam. Namami Shwar, Namami Shwaram, Sat Kirtananda Rupam, Lasat Kundaram, Kukulivatam. Namami Shwaram. Ananda Rupam Rasat Kundalam Lopulevatam On the screen if we can, please. Chatsoda Viro Rupa Vatabhumanam Param Vishnam Matyam Patsodhitya Gopa Chatsoda Viro Rupa Vatabhumanam
Translation. Come on. Where's the translation? Here it comes. To the Supreme Lord, whose form is the embodiment of eternal existence. There's something missing there. The whole thing's not on the screen. Let's see. Come. Knowledge. Yeah, they're getting better. It's the form of eternal existence, knowledge, and bliss. Whose shark shaped earrings. Uh, swinging to and fro. There's a lot of it missing on the screen, isn't it? They're trying to get it all on the screen. Getting smaller and smaller, though. Uh, to and fro. Who? Oh, boy. I think we'll have to get the book out here. It's going to be very difficult to get it all on the screen. I can see that. It's going to get so small, we won't be able to see it. Krishna is smaller than the smallest, but <laughs> we're not able to see him. Um, bring me the book. I've got the book. Is Rasika not as Oh, he's gone. Okay, I have no idea where it is. Anyway, we'll do our best. Um, I haven't memorized the translation, I'm afraid. <laughs> what to do? Where to find the song? I could get one, but I can't direct anyone else to get it because 
um, Mananda just left the room. He knows where it is, but he's not with us. Uh, okay, well, I'm sorry, we can't go through the, the, the uh, translation if we don't have it. So you have to read it yourself, but there's very deep, 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 deep understandings there in, in, in the translation. Different modes of devotion are there. We may be starting again. Oh, here we are. We've got it. Thank you. To the Supreme Lord, whose form is the embodiment of eternal existence, knowledge and bliss. We're trying to keep it stable. Whose shark-shaped earrings are swinging to and fro. Who is beautifully shining in the divine realm of Goku. Who, due to the offense of breaking the pot of yogurt, that his mother was churning into butter, and then stealing the butter that was kept hanging from a swing, is quickly running from the wooden grinding mortar in fear of Mother Yasoda, but who has been caught from behind by her who ran after him with greater speed to that Supreme Lord, Sri Damodar, I offer my humble obeisances. Can you imagine anyone running at greater speed than the Lord? Is her devotion is so ever accelerating, intense devotion. Seeing the whipping stick in his mother's hand, he is crying and rubbing his eyes again and again with his two lotus hands. His eyes are filled with fear and a necklace of pearls around his neck, which is marked with three lines like a conch shell, is shaking because of his quick breathing due to crying. To this Supreme Lord, Sri Damodar, whose belly is bound, not with ropes, but with his mother's pure love, I offer my humble obeisances. Just meditate on this. This is so purifying. Whatever our position is, it's just so purifying to just meditate on this. Mood of devotional love. And just see how Krishna is reciprocating like an ordinary child or like a friend or a lover of his devotees, so that they also can relish the sweetness of the that relationship. By such childhood pastimes as this, he is drowned in the inhabitants of Gokul in pools of ecstasy and is revealing to those devotees who are absorbed in knowledge of his supreme majesty and opulence that he is only conquered. This is today's verse, and it's in the thing only conquered by devotees whose pure love is imbued, imbued, imbued with intimacy and is free from all conceptions of awe and reverence. With great love, I again offer my obeisances to Lord Damodar hundreds and hundreds of times. Interesting how Prabhupada lived in the Radha Damodar temple. I was in power with Vairupa Goswami and Jiva, and Jiva Goswami Kaviraj Goswami and even Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj has a Pushpa Samadhi in that temple. There were many other great devotees also. Oh Lord, although you are able to give all kinds of benedictions, I do not pray to you for the boon of impersonal liberation, nor the highest liberation of eternal life in Vaikuntha, nor any other boon which may be obtained by executing the nine processes of Bhakti. Oh Lord, I simply wish that this form of yours as Balagopal in Vrindavan may ever be manifest in my heart. For what is the use to me of any other boon besides that? Or this. Dhruva. We just heard the story of Dhruva Maharaj this morning. O oh Lord, your lotus face, which is encircled by locks of soft black hair, tinged with red, is kissed again and again by Mother Yasoda. And your lips are reddish like the bimba fruit. May this beautiful vision of your lotus face be ever manifest in my heart. Thousands and thousands of other benedictions are of no use to me. O Supreme Godhead, I offer my obeisances unto you, O Damodar. O Ananta, O Vishnu, O Master, O my Lord, be pleased upon me. Whatever level we're on, <laughs> please be pleased that I can move forward. By showering your glance of mercy upon me, deliver this poor, ignorant fool who is immersed in an ocean of worldly sorrows 
and become visible to my eyes. O oh Lord Damodak, just as the two sons of Kuvera, Manigriva and Nalakuvra, were delivered from the curse of Narada and made into great devotees by you in your form as a baby tied with rope to a wooden grinding mortar. In the same way, please give to me your own prema bhakti. I only long for this and have no desire for any kind of liberation. Prema bhakti. Hmm. Oh, Lord Damodar, I first of all offer my obeisances to the beautifully, brilliantly affordant rope which binds your belly. I then offer my obeisances to your belly, which is the, the abode of the entire universe. I humbly bow down to your most beloved Srimati Radharani, and I offer all obeisances unto you, the Supreme Lord, who displays unlimited pastimes. Nantalila, referring to all the various pastimes of the universe. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Dhammadarastakam Ki Jai. So three days may be left. Take advantage of these days. Hear the translation and try to be more Krishna conscious. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go to pray, Manandi. Hari Hari. Hari Hari. Bo. Jai. Prabhu. Jai. Thank you, Maras. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.